Well, happy April Fools to all of you. Amen. You know, uh, title of today's lesson is April Fooled. Oh, no, April Fooled. <laughs> April Fooled. <laughs> you know, I got a little story for you. I think it might be a true story, but maybe not. So Forrest Gump died. Oh, that's not true. April Fools. Just kidding. No, so Forrest Gump dies and shows up in the gates of heaven. And Saint Peter approached him and said, Hello, I'm Saint Peter, but you can call me Pete. Forrest says, well, My name's Forrest Gump, but you can call me Forrest Gump. And Peter said, Well, Forrest, before I let you in, you've got to answer two questions. Forrest says, Well, okay, Pete. Is it about a box of chocolates? Peter says, No, Forrest, it's not about a box of chocolates. But the first question is, How many seconds are there in a year? Forrest thinks for a few minutes and then he says, well, I do believe that there are 12 seconds in a year. Yeah. Peter says, 12? Where'd you get that from? He says, well, why, yes, there's 12. There's January 2nd, February 2nd, March 2nd. <laughs> Peter says, okay, okay, I'll give you that one. For the next question, what is God's name? And Forrest thinks for a moment. He says, well, I, I do believe that his name's Howard. <laughs> Peter shakes his head and just goes, where the heck did you get that from? He says, well, from the Lord's Prayer. Father, Howard be your name. <laughs> you know, uh, we can be so fooled by the things we think we hear and the things that we think we see and perceive in this world. And you know, God's Word is supposed to protect our hearts from being fooled by the schemes of Satan. And I think we've got to understand this morning as we get into God's Word here, that if we get fooled by Satan in our hearts, that we fumble in life. Let's look at a passage that deals with the issue of our hearts receiving the Word of God. Let's go to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Today's text, we're going to study the parable of the sower. Okay. We're going to begin right here in verse 1 of Mark chapter 4. Now it says, Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake, because Jesus was always teaching. That's why it's again. The crowds that gathered around Him were so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake. You know, you know there's got to be a large crowd when you feel the need to get out on a boat to get away from the crowd so you can actually speak. Yeah. Come on. He says, well, all, just picture this. While all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. What a scene. What a scene to have so many people who want to hear the Word of God that they crowd Jesus off the shore into a boat and they're all just standing at the water's edge waiting to hear the Word of God. It says, He taught them many things by parables. And in His teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that it did not bear grain. Now still other seed fell on good soil. It grew, it came up, grew, and produced a crop, multiplying 30, 60, or even 100 times. Is that not awesome? Then Jesus said, He who has ears, let him hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secrets of the kingdom of God have been given to you. But those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing and never perceiving. They got fooled. And ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Jesus was so powerful. 
see, they were seeing, they came and saw what happened. They were there, they heard what happened, but they couldn't understand the secrets of God's kingdom. They got fooled. And, and I love as he goes on here, how Jesus reacted to people getting fooled here in verse 13. Yeah. Well. He didn't show them pity. He didn't respond how we might think Jesus would respond. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? Wow, they must have felt not that big right there, you know. Let let me ask you a question. I want to ask you the same question that Jesus asked them. Do you understand this parable? This morning. See, Jesus asked, just as He said to His disciples, if you don't understand how this parable applies to your life, how will you understand any parable in the Bible? See, right here, God compares our hearts with soil in the ground. And He says there's four types of soils here. There's actually one that there is no soil. It doesn't, the seeds don't even make it to the soil. There's just none. Then there's shallow soil. Someone who's shallow in their character and in their understanding of God, in their heart. And then there is the third one, which is a ruined soil, a soil that used to be good. Now, you ever, uh, you ever been out to a farmland where they can't grow anything anymore? You see, it's just dry. It's almost like sand. And there is a soil that can get ruined, that was once fertile. And then there is the good fertile soil that this that the scripture is talking about. We're going to go through the four different soils today and see if the if we can't get some more out of this passage. Amen. <laughs> Obviously, there's four soils, so we have four points today. Okay. The first point is. Fooled by unbelief. Go to Mark chapter 4. We'll we'll continue on to verse 14. As Jesus himself explains the parables to us. Mark 4 and verse 14. The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. There's two other parallel passages to this scripture. One in Luke 8. Verse 11. And right there it says in, in Luke 8, 11 that the seed is the Word of God. And so what's being sown in people's hearts is God's Word. And he says this one here is a person that maybe a disciple goes out and shares their faith with. Invites them to church. Shares their life. And the person just isn't responsive. They've heard about God, but it makes no impact in their heart. There is no soil at all. You know, Matthew 13, 18, in the other account, it says when it talks about when someone hears the message of the kingdom. And, and so, hearing the message, the, the seed, if you will, is the message about God's kingdom. And it says people hear about God's kingdom but don't understand that it's really God's kingdom and the truth and what they need in their life. And so they hear the Word of God, but yet they doubt its validity. Or they doubt the person teaching the Word of God. The bottom line is there's enough interest to hear someone out, but not a belief that it should be the standard for their life. You know, I remember being in this place. When I was in college, I was a philosophy major. And my mom took me to a Baptist church all growing up, and I saw hypocrisy. I saw, I remember we had major trials in my family life, and the pastor lived a couple miles away from our house, and my mother and father had gotten into physical altercations. And uh, I, I feared so much for my mother that I ran out of the house, I ran to the minister's house, banged on his door and he came and opened the door and he was drunk as a skunk. I still remember the, just his face pink 
and the smell of the alcohol. And uh, boy, for me, I didn't believe that any word of God that came out of that man. And that transcended into not believing the word of God out of anyone's mouth. Because everyone was hypocrites. In my mind. You know, it's an interesting thing that the Bible says in Matthew 7, says it again in Luke 13, and again in 1 Peter 3, that only a few will believe. How about it this morning? Are you going to be one of the few? Or will you be fooled by unbelief? If you're visiting today, don't be fooled by unbelief. Let's move on to the next, uh, next soil. Okay. Mark 4 and verse 16. The Bible says, Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. That's awesome. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Our second point is fooled by shame. Come on. Satan can fool us with shame. And you go, well, how do you get shame out of no root? Well, let's dig into it a little bit here. Right. If someone has no root. See, right here, the rock part of this, the rocky places, represents a heart that at once believed the word when it heard it, but then very quickly hardened up again like rock. See, this person lets the Word of God in, but did not let the Word of God go deep down into every area of their life, and thus got hardened again. See, the person hears the Word, but this hardness, this rock, if you will, of a heart, causes them to actually not obey the Word of God that they hear. See, we know the truth of the Scriptures to be... That disobedience to the Scriptures produces a rock-hard heart. You know what I'm talking about there? Yeah. And, and so, not only does sin make our hearts like rocky soil, which cannot produce fruit, and we know the Bible refers to fruit as being the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But it also is the fruits of making other disciples. Taking one person who does not know God, teaching them about God, making them into a believer, and helping them come to a knowledge and a saving relationship with God. And so, and so right here we come to find that recurring sin in our lives gets our hearts harder and harder and harder. Recurring sins actually produce loads of guilt and, yes, of shame in our lives. All right. Hopefully that's not you this morning. Come on. But, you know, shame is one of Satan's most powerful tools to fool people. Right. Yeah. So true. And I've just got to ask you this morning, as someone who has come to hear the Word of God preached, are there things happening in your life that you're ashamed of. Well. Things that maybe you're ashamed to talk about. Areas you're ashamed to delve into to get help on. Are you one person at church and another person at, at home with your family? Or your roommates? You see, because if you are... You've become the rocky soil. The hardness of heart is stopping the seed of God's Word from making you fruitful. From letting you experience joy and peace and kindness and gentleness and happiness. It keeps you from fulfilling your mission given by God to make other disciples. You know, is, I mean, honestly, is there some sin that 
has gripped you so much that you're too ashamed to talk about it with anyone to get help? You know, I, I do appreciate how openly and vulnerably Neil shared this morning. But are you willing to get open like that? It's one thing to get up in front of people. That's tough. Right. It's not as tough just one-on-one -on -one with people, but are you too ashamed to even do it in that setting with someone who you know can help you spiritually? I think of my own life as a Christian, and I think the thing that has produced the most shame in my heart over the years at different times is when I don't have great times with God. And I come to church and haven't had great times with God, and I know it. Yep, come on. And I feel shame over it. And I've had those times in my life where I just didn't want to get open. Oh, well, you know, I've been a leader and I just haven't had a great time with God. And it's a funny thing what happens when we have shame because we're disobeying God. Someone who is full of shame, who has a rock-hard heart, is always looking for a smokescreen to divert attention from the sin that they're actually in. You all with me? Yeah. yeah. Amen. You're a little quiet. Come on. More on. But you know, talking about things that bother them instead of confessing their sins. Right. Talking about issues or worldly topics instead of the work of God. Right. See, it's a funny thing. Through having recurring sins in our life, things that we don't get rid of, and what I mean by that is maybe you do something once a week that's sinful, but you do the same thing again and again week after week. Right. That would be a pattern in your life. We know the Bible to say a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day to God. Yeah. Well, you know, what if you do it once a month for the rest of your life for 70 years? Would that be a pattern? Yeah. And so think about the things that you fall into, maybe even on a monthly basis as those patterns of things we refuse to get rid of. And, and you know, uh, it's funny. As disciples, through our recurring sin, we learn the art of deceit from Satan. And uh, if you would only get in your Bible and learn from Adam and Eve, <laughs> get us open up the first couple chapters of the Bible and learn about this topic. If you would learn from their shame... And from their deceit and the consequences they paid for being rocky soil. You see, they got their hearts hard. All Adam had to do was clean up the garden and not eat from one tree. That's all he had to do. Just be happy and don't eat from that tree. But they were so ashamed after they sinned that they got deceitful about it. Went and hid like God didn't know where they were at. Come on. <laughs> you know, because we can be like that. We can try and hide like God doesn't see us, you know? Right. On. And then as God tries to expose, did you eat from the tree? Mm -hmm. Well, the ball. <laughs> but he did it. <laughs> Sound familiar to anybody? Yeah. I've been there too. I've been there too. Come on. Come on. <laughs> But I think about the consequences that came about because they let their shame take over. Adam had to work the field quite vigorously. That was his punishment. He would always work the fields for the rest of his life. He would toil in labor over the fields instead of being able to dance around all the time. Have fun. Eve and all women after her had to desire her husband. We'll talk about that in a minute. But go to James chapter 3. Amen. James chapter 3. And through this passage, I want to make an appeal to you this morning. All right, James 3, in verse 13. The Bible said, Who is wise and understanding among you? Well, Raise your hand if you're wise and understanding among us. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> April Fools. <laughs> but who's wise and understanding among you? 
Well, this is how you know who's wise and understanding among you. Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. Wow. So, now you know who's wise amongst us. Those who are living a great life. And if you're not living a great life, you've been fooled by Satan. Come on. Because a good life produces humility, the exact opposite of rocky places in the heart. He says, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven. See, because when we want to talk about all the problems and issues, it's because we have all this wisdom and are the authority on the topic we're talking about. But he says, such wisdom does not come down from heaven because it's from our deceit about what's really going on in our own life. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and actually of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. You know, I want to make an appeal to you this morning. If you're harboring bitter envy, selfish ambition, or something like this in your heart, don't deny it this morning. Deal with it. Through the power of the Scriptures. Amen? Amen. But sadly, so many, even in this room, are ensnared by the trap of shame. But today, the, the awesome news is you can make a decision this morning. You can make a decision through the power of the Holy Spirit to free yourself from that trap. But you've got to know what the Bible says about where it leads you and what the consequences are to make a right choice. Here's where the end begins to come for someone whose heart is rocky soil and is full of shame and stays in that place. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Because if you know what it looks like when someone is taken out by it, then you can make a decision to not get there. You know what I'm saying? 1 Corinthians 4, in in verse 4, Paul says right here, my conscience is clear. But that doesn't make me innocent. You know, just because you might have a clear conscience this morning doesn't mean you're innocent. He says, indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience... Oh... Excuse me there. My conscience is clear, but that's not making me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. We rush to judgment so quickly on things, you know? God's always going to reveal everything. Through patience, we can find out God's will eventually. But we want it now, usually. That's how we get into sin. He says, He will bring to light... Check this out. You got something hidden in your life? You got some recurring thing that you're not talking about dealing with? Here's what the Lord says right here. It says, He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. See, this is the point at which someone who is filled with shame begins to get taken out. See, when God exposes what's really happening in your life, you have two choices. Be humble and deal with it. And accept the consequences for hiding in your sin already. Or try and do a bigger smoke screen. (laughs) Which do you usually choose when God exposes what's happening with you? You see, there are consequences for letting our hearts get hard knowing we're there and staying in that place for a long time and being rocky soil. See, Adam had to work and toil. See, this is where we talk about Eve as well. Eve became... Eve's consequence for being in this place was God made her weak-willed so that she would desire her husband even when she didn't want to. What do you think the consequences will be for you if you stay in this place? And beyond that, what do you think the consequences... Just like Eve's consequences transcended down to all women, what consequences do you think will transcend down from you to all those you are in contact with? Come on, bro. What will affect those around you, especially those who you claim to love? Like our kids. See, as the minister, it's a funny thing. 
It's my job to know what's happening in the church and to deal with what's happening in the church and to minister to the needs of the church so that the church can be healthy and the church can advance the work of God. That's my, that's my job, right? It's one of my roles. But here's how God exposes to me who has shame and who does not. See, because there's, we're given the secret things of God. <laughs> the way God exposes it to me is I see people who consistently want to talk about their issues with the church or their qualms with other disciples. That's how I know someone has shame in their life. If there's a consistency of that in a person's life, they have their own sin that they're hiding and that's a smoke screen. So I've got to dig down in and get past the smoke screen. Sometimes people can block really well. But go to Jude chapter 1. There's only one chapter in Jude. But. In verse 12. Right here, we come to find the person that's full of shame, hiding, diverting attention from themselves. It says, these men are blemishes at your love feast, eating with you without the slightest qualm. Shepherds who only feed themselves. They are clouds without rain, blowing along the wind, autumn trees, without fruit, and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, here it is, foaming up their shame. Wandering stars for whom darkest, blackest darkness has been reserved Forever. See, there are grave consequences for being the rocky soil and staying the rocky soil. Come on, bro. For me as the minister, I'll share a little bit here, I often have to be the one that God uses to expose what's hidden in darkness. And the people who are full of shame, almost always, if they're not going to break and get humble, almost always get angry about how God exposes what's happening in their life. How things are said, what is said, who heard it, how it came about. Everything except humility. Because shame takes away humility. Everything except humility. Everything except a broken and contrite spirit that wants to do the will of God. And be right in their life. See, the anger that comes is a smoke screen to cover up a refusal to repent of sin. Yeah. I've been there before, and some of us have been here not too long ago. But you know, uh, you've got to understand this morning, the shame of disobedience, the rock-hard heart coupled with the consequences lead to people wanting to take an opportunity of trouble or of persecution as their way out of their shame. Yeah. And that's when they walk away from the church. I think as brothers and sisters, we've got to be mindful of how Satan gets us. Yeah, no. We've got to be mindful so that we can see the stage that people are in right. as Satan tries to take them out. So that we can get in there and dig into people's hearts and help people to not be fooled by shame. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thirdly, let's go to Mark chapter 4. Right. We'll continue on where we left off in verse 18. It'll get better before the end. Come on. Come on. The first three soils are all bad. <laughs> what, do you, what, what do you want from me, man? <laughs> Mark 4 and verse 18. He says, Still others, like seeds sown among the thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth... And the desire for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Wow. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Our third soil is fooled by worry. Yeah, it's a funny thing. Because as disciples, we sacrifice so much financially, we sacrifice so much of our time, we sacrifice so much of our focus to help others. It's so easy for Satan to get us with the worry thing. 
to worry about having time to take care of our own life. You know, I think even about my own life right now. Man, Satan's trying to make me worry. We just, we just took my mom in for a procedure uh, Friday to test if she has lymphoma. My dad just found out he has diabetes. Uh, my dad's not been doing too well spiritually. We are uprooting our family and moving all the way on the opposite side of the country. Six different city in six years for us. You know, what things do you worry about in your life? What things can cause you to totally disobey God and worry? Because that's what worry is. Because what does God say? Do not what? Worry. (laughs) And so if you worry, you're disobeying what God says to do. But what things make you worry? See, most people don't realize the magnitude, the impact of worrying because they don't see it as disobedience to God. They just see it as, well, that's just where I'm at. But most people don't go, oh, well, I'm totally disobeying God right now. Go to Matthew chapter 6. God gives us a, a path out of worry. He gives us a path out of worry. Verse 25. He says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Well, that's awesome. See, all you got to do is go, oh, okay, I'm going to stop worrying right now. <laughs> well, you didn't believe me. <laughs> it's, actually, it's, actually, it's actually that easy. Be- because what I just read right there, that's God's word. That's truth. Yep. See, if Michael Smith over here tells you don't worry, that's a different story. I don't know if you want to believe Michael Smith if he tells you that. But if he shows you God's word and you read it, and those are God's words, and it says don't worry, and you choose to worry, yeah. wow. That's in the same category. Okay, do not commit sexual immorality. Well, if you go commit sexual immorality... You disobeyed God. Well, what if you worry, though? It's no different. Right. It's just different consequences. Wow. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink about your body, or what you will wear. Is not life more important than food? Come on. Is not life more important than food? Come on. <laughs> the body more important than clothes. And he's talking about the body of Christ. Right. Look at the birds of the air. Well, I'd like to do that right now, but kind of inside right now. (laughs) But if you could pierce through the windows here and see the birds of the air. Do you know, you you, you ever seen a bird that starved to death? Why not? I mean, God takes care of them. He meets their needs. Now, they don't work. They don't, show up to, they don't show up at their job at 8 o'clock in the morning. Wow. Actually, they show up outside your window chirping at 6 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> they don't store away in barns. Yet God takes care of them. Wow. This is that your Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? See, if you worry, you don't believe that you're more valuable to God than a burden. Now, this is funny. Who of you by worrying could add a single hour to his life? <laughs> I love it. In Luke, in Luke he, right after he says that, he says, right after he says that, he says, you can't even do this simple thing. Like, adding an hour to your life is a simple thing. <laughs> it actually is, because God says it is. But he says, why do you worry about clothes? Why do you worry about your house? Right. Why do you worry about your kids? So much that you put them before God. So much that you put your house before God. So much that you can't show up to, to church when we have church. Yeah. Come on, so much that you can't go and be in a study when someone who's lost right. needs you. Mom. Why do you worry? He says, see how the lilies of the field grow. You ever seen a flower? It doesn't show up to work at 8 o'clock either. But you know, God made nature where if man doesn't come and trample that flower, 
it will grow. It will be taken care of. Right. Only a man can choose to ruin that. In and of itself, it just happens. Wow. He says, yet I tell you that not even Solomon was dressed like a flower. Solomon was the greatest king ever lived. He, he had the most stylish clothes of his time. Right. Now, they didn't have Armani back then. But they had some cool stuff. Probably coming back into fashion like the 70s stuff right. next year. <laughs> But he says, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, oh, you of little faith? It's so awesome to be around Jesus. Don't understand parables. You have no faith. <laughs> and we get mad at each other like we come down on each other too hard. Jesus was the man, dude. But the problem is right there. You worry because you lack faith. You have issues because you lack faith. You do your smoke screens because you lack faith. He says, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first His kingdom. And His righteousness and all these things will be given as well. See, if you seek first His kingdom, not seek first your job, not seek first your kids, not seek first your marriage, not seek first your wife, if you seek first His kingdom and being righteous, all this that you need will be given to you. Amen. Do you believe that this morning? Yeah. You see, like we talked about on Friday, there's a difference between believing something and having a deep conviction about it. You know what I'm saying? Amen. So if you believe this passage, this is the way you will begin to live. Amen. He says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow, worry about self. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You know, worry produces anxiety. Yeah. Prolonged anxiety produces anger and bitterness. And Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope deferred, which is worry, makes the heart sick. Yeah. And Jesus himself asked you that question, why do you worry? Yeah. The lack of faith. Here's, the mo here's some of the best news you're going to get this morning, alright? You can get more faith. <laughs> how about that? You can get more faith. Romans 10, 17 tells us how to do it. It says that you, that you get faith from hearing the message. And the message comes from the Word of God. And so, this is really cool actually. Because you can hear the message by reading your Bible. Yeah. You can hear your message by listening to sermons, so, much, so long as it's not false doctrine. Yeah. And you can hear the message from other disciples sharing scriptures with you. Amen. And so you have all kinds of options on how to get more faith here this morning. Amen. You got it. I gave you at least three and there's more. Yeah. But the incredible thing is faith is something you decide to have or you decide not to have. See, if you're worrying, you've decided to worry. You've dug your heels in with the Lord and said, no, I'm going to worry. Even though you say don't, I'm going to worry. Because I know better than you, is what you're really saying. I don't believe you, I think you're a liar, and I know better than you. That's what we say to God when we worry. But really, all you need to do is choose one of your options on how to hear the message and get faith. Decide the Bible is true, that God is sovereign, and simply believe the message. How about that? Is that not awesome? Yeah. God has got your back. Yeah. He is committed to your welfare. More than all the animals on the face of this earth. Yeah. He's totally committed if you will seek first his kingdom. See, there's an if in the midst of that. Because if you don't seek first His kingdom, if you don't seek first His righteousness, then He won't give all those things. In fact, He'll make sure you can't have them. And it puts you in an endless loop of chasing after things, trying to get them yourself, and letting, instead of the joy. You know, isn't it awesome when you get a present? Right. See, God set it up where if you'll believe Him, He'll constantly give you presents and you'll have everything you need. Otherwise, you're trying to take it by force at war with God and you think you're going to get something from Him? You think you're going to steal? See, he says, that's stealing from me. 
So you can either try and steal from God and get nothing, or you can just focus on being righteous and happy and loving, and He'll give you everything you need along the way. Your choice. Amen. Come on, bro. All right. You got it. Come on. But it's so awesome that as disciples, we don't have to chase after what the world chases after. You get to run and play like Adam in the Garden of Eden and let God provide everything for you if you will just believe the message. Amen? Do not be fooled by worry this morning. We'll close out in Mark 4.20. We have one more scripture, but we'll close out with this point. Mark chapter 4 and verse 20. We'll continue on. The end of the parable of the sower. All right. Hold on. He says, Others, like seeds sown among on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Is that not awesome? Amen. 30, 60, or even a hundred times what was sown. Come on. Wouldn't that be awesome to baptize 60 people this next year? A hundred people this next year? Maybe just even one, amen? <laughs> You know, our last point is simply be fooled for Christ. Be fooled for Christ. Here's the bottom line, guys. If this last soil doesn't describe you, one of the other three does. There's no, there's a, there's some things that are not black and white, but this one is one of those things that is. You're either the fourth soil or you're one of the other three soils. End of story. Newsflash, okay? The other three soils don't go to heaven if they stay that way. The first three don't go to heaven if they stay that way. That means some of you need to make decisions this morning. Come on. Thank God that there is a cure to being a fool. Yeah. Amen? Go to 1 Corinthians 3. See, when you become a minister, then you'll have April Fools and you can call everybody fools for an hour. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> but that's okay because God calls me one too. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. Paul says, Don't deceive yourselves. If any of you think he is wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool. So that he may become wise. It's pretty cool how that works, huh? Everything's backwards in the kingdom. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. Some of us are really smart. But that works against us because we rely on those smarts. He says, so then no more boasting about men. Let's talk about God. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours and you are Christ. And Christ is God. You know, I want to challenge you this morning to become foolish in the eyes of the world. I want to challenge you to talk about God so much that you look like a fool to people around you. You know, what this takes to become a fool for Christ is just simply obeying Matthew 6, 33. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. That's all it takes. Because let me tell you, if you seek first His kingdom with His righteousness, the world is not doing that, okay? There's enough disciples already that are not doing that. we got to get it on straight here, guys. See, I want to challenge you to... Invite so many people next Sunday that you look like a fool to everybody. I mean, take advantage of the opportunity. Next Sunday is Easter Sunday, guys. It's the easiest Sunday in the world to get people to come to church. But if you couple that with being a fool, inviting person after person after person, looking like a madman, a madwoman, God's going to bless your life for seeking first His kingdom. He said it, not me. It's a promise from him. Come on. Next Sunday is our special missions contribution. Yeah. Give so much of your money that the people in your life think you're a fool for giving it all. Come on. Come on. You know, like every year, next Sunday, our bank account will be down to nothing. Yeah. Like what happens every year in April. Come on. And you know, it's a funny thing. 
if you look, I'm not lacking anything. Okay. I, I, every year, all the money's gone. Every year. And every year God provides yeah. everything we need. I want to challenge you to be so open with your life, with the brothers and sisters that can help you, that it seems foolish to those people that would not be open. Do things that... Do these things so much that to the lukewarm disciples, you look foolish to them. See, the real question this morning is going to be, whose fool are you going to be? Are you going to choose to be Satan's fool? Or are you going to choose to be a fool for God? I love what he, I love what he goes on to say here in chapter 4, 1 Corinthians. He says, So then men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and those entrusted with the secret things of God. Isn't it good to be trusted by God? God says, hey, I don't trust everybody else, but since you're my kid, I'm going to trust you with the secret things about me. He says, now it is required that those who have been given a trust prove faithful. The sad reality is you have more of a chance of being a fool for Satan than you do of being a fool for Christ. You can be fooled by unbelief. You can be fooled by shame. And you can be fooled by worry. And if you're visiting this morning and you felt a little foolish this morning, we still care about you. We love you. I want to encourage you to get with the person who brought you and study the Bible to learn how to be a fool for Christ. And if you're a disciple of Jesus this morning, realize that you've been entrusted with the secrets of God. Let's make decisions to prove faithful ourselves. Don't be April fooled. Have an awesome day. Amen.